Welcome to Stoughton Media Access Cable's Community Forum Show. My name is Steve Kelly. I'll be your host today. And uh, today I have the pleasure of um, bringing to you one of Stoughton's own who's made it good. <laughs> so, thank you. Scott Aronson. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank and, you for and, having me. And Scott is a uh, podiatrist and somebody that uh, wanted to make something of himself. And his mom, who I happen to know on the side, is a very, uh, very nice woman. And she said she always wanted Scott to be a doctor. So uh, tell us a little bit about what interested you into podiatry. Well, <clears throat> I knew I always wanted to go into medicine. So years ago, back in high school, when I discussed it with people, they said, well, if you want to get into medicine, maybe you should you know, volunteer at the local hospital. So right down the street here, I'd volunteer at the, at the Sinai Hospital as a, like a candy striper, basically, yeah. and go around and play some games with some of the, the patients in there. And, and then um, future later years, I worked at the Goddard Hospital. And I actually worked doing a lot of things and, and uh, working overnight shifts, and then I even continued to work in college. So I knew medicine was definitely for me. Looked into a lot of different types of medicine, and I knew a couple of podiatrists in the area, would visit their offices, shadow them, and I could see right away that podiatry was a, um, a, a nice family type of uh, business or a practice where you could treat people from zero to 100 years old. Patients, you know, I <laughs> yeah. see children, I see their parents, their grandparents, and their great-great-grandparents. And the other thing that I really like about podiatry and enjoy is there's often that instant, instant relief that I can give people. They can come in the office, and it's not always going to be 10, 12 visits. Sometimes they can get relief in one visit. They can come in, whether it's a corn or callus or heel pain, and they can leave that same day feeling better. So that's a lot wow. of fun. Now you have an office right here in Canton, right? Canton, yes. Right, you've just opened it. Uh, so I was in Stoughton for the for 19 years, yep. right, right over the Goddard Hospital, and and I decided to move just down the street for a couple of different factors. And uh, we have a beautiful practice right in Canton, right down on Route 138, just over the line from Stoughton, just a couple of feet, uh, just three miles from my old office. So it's yep. been very easy, very convenient for people, and uh, we have everything right on site. We do X-rays, we do ultrasounds. We can do minor procedures in the office, so it's very convenient. Yeah. And uh, what about insurance? I mean, you can handle all of the insurance, the different yeah. insurances. Yes, and we take like that. most insurances. Um, yeah. I, I can't think of one that we don't take, yeah. um, from the Medicare to the Mass Health to all the private insurances. So that's usually not a problem. Okay. Yeah. Now you went to school at Temple. So I went undergraduate, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Yep. Then I went to a school um, back then when I went. It was called Pennsylvania College of Podiatric Medicine. It's all now. Right part of Temple, which um, they merged with Temple and became part of Temple. So officially I am a graduate of Temple University, yep. and then I continued on to do a two-year residency in Philadelphia. So you became very specialized though, mm -hmm. and as opposed to like a general practitioner. Uh, like, what, like what drew you to think that that was a better idea? Was it the family kind of medicine approach to it that you thought about? Or like, it yeah. seems like, not strange to me, but it seems like you really have to be driven to that place. Well, certainly I don't have a foot fetish, so it's not because of, it's not because of that. <laughs> and you've got a great sense of humor, which is good, right? But um, <laughs> sure, I, you know, there's, like I said, I looked into lots of different types of medicine, and, and one thing that really drove me to podiatry was you can cater it to what you like in terms of the practice. My practice is basically a nine to five type practice, so I could balance work and life. Ah. I could have a family, I could, you know, it was, it was easy that way. Not a lot of emergencies. There's a lot of things that we can deal with over the phone. Um, and then, you know, it's easy to see someone on a Monday, you know, after the weekend, if they've had an injury, they might go to the emergency room or an urgent care clinic first. And um, so it's just, it's a, it was a nice work family balance. I don't think I know anyone who doesn't have a foot issue. <laughs> I mean, everybody has like a bunion, a callus. And if they uh, don't have one now, they likely will. Oh, so it's, oh it, they're going to get yeah, one. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I'd like the audience to come away sort of educated about podiatry. Mm -hmm. Tell us like, like a couple of things you'd like them to know. And maybe you brought in these wonderful, uh, <laughs> uh, this particular thing is a foot that shows um, you can so tell we, us. we got, you know, the, the bones, yeah, you can hold of course, that up and just 26 tell. bones in the feet, yep. but uh, the ligaments, the tendons, and we, we use some foot props because it's, 
it's easy. A picture's worth a thousand words. So it's easy. Yes. I like to demonstrate things. I have signs in the office, posters in the office that really help demonstrate things. I, I like to give patients handouts when they leave because it's difficult. There's a lot of information I might give in a 15, 20 minute, 30 minute you know, visit yep. and it's hard to take everything in. And I prefer that people don't take notes well, you know, <laughs> because they, listen, you know, I, write, want, I want them yeah. to listen. So yeah. we, we give a lot of handouts. We, we have links online, you know, for different conditions. I like to demonstrate things with the foot models. Yep. So just right here, there's a flat foot, a, a regular arch, a high mm -hmm. arch, um, you know, with plantar fasciitis and implants and That's a great one. Let's start with plantar fasciitis. Sure. Let's go on with plantar fasciitis. So about eight, ten years ago, I was playing football way out of my league and running on hard. It was like a frozen surface. And I came up with all torn thing that was ended up I could hardly walk, and mm -hmm. it was called plantar fasciitis. So tell us about what plantar fasciitis and how would you treat it? So plantar fasciitis is a very common, it's probably one of the more common issues that I have that presents in my office. We see kids with plantar fasciitis, uh, you know, adults, it could be active, it could be inactive, it could be anybody can develop plantar fasciitis or heel pain. And there's a lot, you know, first of all, we need to diagnose to see if they truly have plantar fasciitis, because there are, like you mentioned, there are tears in the plantar fascia, there's people with heel spurs, there's nerve entrapment, there's all kinds of other things that we need to rule out. So if we kind of get to the basics of the plantar fasciitis, which is very, very common, we have this ligament on the bottom that attaches on the bottom of the heel. Essentially what's happening is over time, the ligament becomes very tight. And as it, at, when it gets tight, it becomes a little frail, a little brittle. So I like to say that the plantar fascia should be like a rubber band. Now, do we have a picture that we could ask Roy yeah, to bring up? Yeah, there is a picture so, up there. Uh, maybe we, so we have Roy as our producer out back, and, sure. and we're, uh, we're hoping nice we, might, we might get, there we go. Picture of the plantar fascia right there with a the ligament going from the toes to the heel. Now people can have pain anywhere along that plantar fascia. So some people have more pain in the arch, some people will have more pain in the, right in the bottom of the heel. Most people that come in think, I have a spur. It's not always a spur. They may have a spur, they may not have a spur, but it's not the spur that causes the pain. In fact, when the pain goes away, after one, two, three visits, patient will also uh, will very frequently say, what do we do about this spur? I say, well, <laughs> what do you mean? You don't have any pain, don't worry about it. It's not the spur that causes the pain. So with plantar fasciitis, um, once we come up with a diagnosis, we may or may not do x-rays because we want to make sure there's no abnormal pathology. We want to make sure there's no cyst, tumor, fracture, um, anything else abnormal going on in the heel. Once we rule that out and we get to the treating of the plantar fascia, it may be stretching, maybe some icing. We go over all kinds of techniques. I give handouts with pictures to explain yep. all the different techniques. Maybe physical therapy, maybe some oral anti-inflammatories like naproxen. Uh, Aleve, Motrin, Advil, those kind of things. Occasionally we do cortisone injections. Cortisone's not a cure-all, but often that kind of helps people get on the road to recovery. Um, so what is that cortisol? What does it do for us? So the cortisone... I had, I had a couple of those sure, people shots are very boy, familiar. they hurt when they went in. Yeah, oh, <laughs> they, they can be uncomfortable, but we yeah. do have techniques that, yeah. you know, try to, we try to minimize the discomfort yep. of, of any injection, yep. whether we have some spray, it's called ethyl chloride, which is a, a cold spray, and it can numb up the skin a little bit. Most people are feeling pain from the insertion of the needle and a little bit from the pressure as the fluid goes in. But we can minimize some of that depending on mm -hmm. types of needles, the gauge of the needles, the spray that we do ahead of time. Um, but it's decreasing the inflammation. We mix it with uh, some anesthetics like lidocaine and then the steroids. So they get a kind of an instant relief with the lidocaine, with the anesthetic, and then the cortisone sort of kicks in after a day or two. But it's, uh, like I said, it's not a cure-all, and some people come in you know, looking for a cortisone. Yeah. And some people just know that you know, cortisone may not be the, the way they wanna go, whether they had one in their shoulder or their neck or their back, and they just, you know, they're a little nervous, and that's fine, because we have plenty of ways that we can treat the uh, plantar fasciitis. So all this invested time in your schooling, we mentioned 11 years mm -hmm. of schooling, it really is showing right now as you speak, by the way, we have types of needles, the gauge of needles, the different <laughs> things that we can put in, the types of, I mean, that's amazing to hear yeah. you kind of very, um, very easily just jump into every subject. I think that's Well, terrific. like I said, when I treat everybody, it's not just an algorithm. A lot of times medicine has gotten into just an algorithm. You see this, you treat it this way, this you treat that way. And it, it, you know, a lot of times you have to treat the individual. You do have to treat the individual. Yeah. Everyone's gonna be different. Right. I mean, I can see it on someone's face when they come in. You know, right away they've been hesitant because they thought the treatment was gonna be worse than the actual pain. Uh, so we kinda have to get over that and there's different ways to go with everybody. 
different ways to right. treat people. Let me bump you ahead to another friend of mine, no, sure. name, no names here, but he's got some sort of an ulcer on his foot that has to do with diabetes. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what should a person that has any kind of an ulcer on their foot do or not do? Give us some, some stuff. Sure. Well, first of all, any diabetic, and you mentioned the person was diabetic, anybody can get an ulcer or a sore or a callus or a, some abnormality on the bottom of their foot, and that's usually due to pressure. With diabetes, it's more common because they have a de often they have a decreased sensation uh, in the bottom of the foot, so they may not know that they're having friction and they have things that, you know, something that's rubbing on the bottom. They may develop a callus first. Two things that are going to happen when you have friction. One is you could either develop a blister, so somebody goes and does a run and they wear some old sneakers or even some new sneakers or socks that maybe had a little rip in it or something like that, they're going to develop blisters. But um, a little bit of friction over a long period of time, they develop a callus usually. Callus is just a thickened dead skin on the bottom of the heel, or on the bottom of the foot. As that callus builds up, that, now that's a, another force on the deeper layers of the skin. So what can happen, especially in a diabetic, now it's like walking with a rock in the shoe. It's gonna cause so much pressure that can actually develop a sore, Yep. It can get infected, and it develops into what we call a diabetic ulceration. And, and I think we have a picture. Maybe we can get yeah, Roy to pop up. So there's uh, a uh, picture of a callus, yep. and that's you know showing that this person has very high arches. They got a lot of pressure on the ball of the foot. They have the callus underneath the um, big toe joint. And what happens is eventually that wears down, and they have a hole. The Ugh. hole becomes infected. It can re go right into the bone. And now, it's an easy um, access point when you sweat and your feet. It's easy for germs to... Uh, to come up through to the system, a right? absolutely, the blood and everything else. They get infected. The bone can get infected, and typically with bone infection, you, you know, you, it could lead to amputation in a, in, in a most serious case. But it's very important to work. You know, we work with the vascular specialists. We'll work with the neurologist. We'll work with the infectious disease teams at the hospital. So it's, we kind of take a holistic approach, and we get everybody involved when they ha when we have these sort of situations, and um, we do everything we can to sort of decrease the, the pressure on the bottom of the foot, heal the wound, but it's, it's gonna take a lot of, from the patient. A lot of these patients are in denial that, I don't know, this just popped up yesterday, I don't know how, but we know that it's been there for a long <laughs> time. Tell, yeah. By the time they come into the office, it's usually sort of a, a, a later stage of the uh, ulceration. So there's a lot of things that we need to do. It's a lot of training, it's a lot of um, education to the patients, so we can kind of clear that up, but we have to, immediately take pressure off that. The pressure is what caused it. We need to take pressure off of it. If they want to continue to work and continue to be on their feet, we can throw on all these fancy antibiotics and these very expensive wound care products. It's not going to work if they don't take the pressure off. You're so good at handling these like different, I'm just throwing you one thing and you expand so sure. quickly. I think we should probably have to do a call-in show next. Yeah, because okay. the audience can call in with their foot. That would work. Say, Here's what's hurting me now. So. Um, you made me think about a um, situation with running, um, and there's all these different types of running shoes, and there's ideas that you should not wear the same shoe for like more than a few days and then switch out. Tell us a little bit about how an athlete could, uh, might ha handle footwear differently than someone that's like just perhaps going to work, but then, and then changes to their relaxing shoes. But what about an athlete who wants to run five days out of seven, and they want to do, let's say, four miles mm -hmm. in those five days. Should they have two different pairs of sneakers? Give us, a, give me some yeah. ideas. So I, I, I think it's a good idea. I think number one, as I always tell people, because they always, you know, people do want to come in and they ask, what type of sneaker do you recommend? I don't necessarily recommend a type of sneaker or a brand of sneaker. I say you have to go with what's comfortable. That's number one. Everybody, there's so many different foot types out there, and one type of sneaker or one foot, one model of sneaker can't cover everybody. So it's, it's best if somebody's that serious into running to go to a specialized running store. Yep. They can get fitted properly, right. they'll put you on a treadmill, they might have you walk outside, they'll even let you jog outside. So getting fit properly is really important. Okay. Um, now, a lot of times people will get fitted, they still have little issues, they might have a little tendonitis here or there, often we'll make orthotics. This is just an example of an orthotic. This is something that there are over-the-counter orthotics, and people are familiar with a lot of the over-the-counter orthotics. Well, that well first, before you tell us that, you mentioned tendonitis, and, sure. and it's, it's too loose for me. Mm -hmm. What is tendonitis? So tendonitis is an inflammation of a tendon. A tendon will, is, is essentially attaching a muscle to a bone. So What's a ligament, and as different from a so tendon? So a ligament is, is a piece that attaches bone to bone. Okay. A tendon attaches a muscle to the bone. 
So they're different, different structures made up of very similar, similar material, okay. but different structures within the foot. So people can sprain or they can get a, a strain of a tendon or a ligament. Either way, they could be damaged to either. But generally, a ligament would be more of a tear or a pull, and a tendon injury would be more of an inflammation or often we'll see partial tears in a tendon. Okay. So you may have ten, uh, tendonitis on the bottom of the foot, uh, 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 um, Posterior tibialis, well, there's some fancy, fancy Let's names. Let's use that. Things. What is the word? Go ahead. Tibialis posterior tendonitis. You'll see that a lot T with people with flat feet. Tibialis posterior tendonitis. Yes. Very common in people with flat feet. Okay. Because as the foot rolls in, they get a lot of tendonitis on the inside of the foot. As you talk, I'm like moving my feet, yeah, trying to so, feel things. This yeah. is interesting. So, yeah. uh, so a lot of that, you know, and a lot of times we need to kind of shore up the position of the foot to take pressure off and take pressure off that tendon so it's not stretching out. It's not overstretching. Another one that pe people hear very often is Achilles tendonitis. Yes. Achilles tendonitis can be a very difficult to, uh, it's not a true tendonitis, but it, we treat it as a tendonitis. It's still inflammation around the tendon. It still can be tears within the substance of the Achilles tendon. So smaller tears? Like smaller tears, you can get almost microscopic tears. Sometimes you, you can actually feel on the back of the heel, the tendon coming down, and then it almost feels like an hourglass appearance where there's a, almost like a knot in the bottom of the he in the uh, back of the heel. Wow. And that's just sort of scar tissue of the I Achilles tendon. And those can be very, very difficult to treat. And most of the time, it's from overuse injuries. We see it in overuse injuries in athletes, high school athletes all the time. They're not doing proper stretches. They're just going out there and- Oh, so now you've brought another thing to <laughs> See, this is a great interview. <laughs> so what are the proper stretches? Tell, tell us, like what, if I was going to, um, Let's say I was going to run four laps around the local okay. high school track, right? What should I do first? So let's back up a little bit. I think okay. it's very important, and this is, I stress this all, to uh, kids all the time. Okay. I hate to segue, but I have kids that no, come please, in with a please. condition called a calcaneal apophysitis. I love this. Calcaneal apophysitis. Right. Apophysitis. Apophysitis. And that's okay. an inflammation of the growth plate in the back of the heel. We see a lot of kids... 11, 12 for girls, 12, 13 with boys, depends on their maturity. Yep. But they have pain in the back of the heel. Yes. Now a lot of parents, they, they go online, they Google heel pain and what's gonna come up, we already mentioned plantar fasciitis and heel pain. With children, it's a totally different animal. Typically they get this calcaneal apophysitis, which is like I said, that inflammation of the growth plate. And often it's from not stretching. They go out, they're, they're running, you know, everybody's busy, they're on a busy schedule, they're running to soccer practice or football practice, whatever, they're getting there just in the nick of time, and they're not stretching. They just go right out and do their activity. It makes that much difference to stretch first. Absolutely. Stretching the hamstring, stretching the quads, stretching the calf, very, very important. How would you do that to, without getting up? I mean, yeah. so you say you, can't, you say it, but we're trying to transfer so it just through the TV some medium. Tip, right, so some typical... bend over, touch your toe? What do you do? Yeah, bending over, touching your toe, put your foot up against the wall, kind of to, to get the, the calf muscles and the Achilles tendon stretched out. Sometimes just um, laying down on the, on the ground and, and leaning forward. Sometimes people can do it as partners when they're you know, a sports team where one can lay on the ground, the other can put the leg up and kind of give it a little extra stretch. But there's, there are certainly a lot of, and there's a lot of resources online. And do that slowly? Do it slowly. How long? How long? So typically when people stretch, they, yes, slowly is very important. We see a lot of people that overstretch. So you have to be careful not to overstretch because <laughs> yeah, okay. you, can, you can tear. So yeah, you you're can, tearing you, it as you're trying to prepare right, you're trying, it to work, So a nice right? slow stretch, hold it for 10 seconds, do that for about 10 reps and just get a nice even stretch. And you'll feel it in the, in the, in the muscles, whether yeah. you're doing the, the calf or the hamstrings, but right. it's very, very important. And then even to do a light jog. Get, get warmed up, get the muscles warmed up. If you just go out there and you just start doing your sprints and all your, your drills, they can get in, you know, have, have lots of problems. So I think at a very early age, yep. it's very important to get kids and the coaches involved and get them stretching. And then later on, people will know when we get older, you know, we kind of have to because we just yeah. can't do it. We can't move that quickly. But um, so all these stretches easily found online. There's plenty of resources online. But I, um, and then sometimes we'll even send people to physical therapy. We'll say, okay, well, you're real tight. Your calves are tight. Your hamstrings are tight. We'll often send people to physical therapy to do some stretching exercises. They can really spend the time with them yep. to do some home stretching exercises. Then people can take that and just continue on with their lives and do it as a regular basis. Yeah, so I lift weights. Mm -hmm. And just to do the weightlifting, 
my stretch, I have a five stretch thing right. that I do, and the first is to just take the bar with no weight on it and do a throw over, over my head 10 times, right? That Very gets good. it up. And the second one is to do a crouch and then use the legs to throw the bar up. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, not the last one, the third one was put over my neck, the bar, and then stretch down. So yeah. I'm getting the hamstrings and stuff. You're getting all the so, yeah. So that's really, I, I found it's been, and I'm not even running, I'm just gonna lift weights. You're going to reduce stretches. You will reduce a lot of injuries that way. Most of the injuries you hear, all these injuries these days with kids with the with the uh, injuries that they're getting in high school sports and things, and yeah. they're having surgeries even before they start college. I think a lot of them can be prevented with yeah, proper I, training. Not you know really be, being careful of the overuse. I think I remember as a kid with little league, we you know you can only pitch certain innings. I think these kids are just doing way too much, and they're they're doing sports you know year round. Yep. They're not taking the breaks that we used to take, but life is different. So I have a six-year-old grandson who lives with us, and mm. uh, we bike all the time. Give me an example of like what could we do before we bike? Um, and I don't seem to have any trouble biking, more trouble running, but, mm -hmm. but I want to make sure I teach him some good stuff. So Yeah, I think it wouldn't, happen. it wouldn't hurt for him to bend over, touch his toes, and, and work on stretching the legs out a little bit before he does it. Just more to get in the habit of doing it. You know, so, just to, you know, just some of your typical runner stretches. Have him, you know, if there's something that he could put his foot up and, and stretch and bend over to get a little bit of the hamstrings. Like I said, just to get him more into the, the habit of doing it. All right. Let's go to um, ingrown toenails, and maybe sure. Roy can bring us up a, a slide. Okay. And, and by the way, I want to tell the audience that Scott came very well prepared, <laughs> I mean, you know, to, ha to give us the proper slides and some information, and we don't always get guests as well prepared, so thank you for that. <laughs> My pleasure. So uh, let's look at an ingrown toenail and talk about that, because so many people have them. Yeah, so ingrown to toenails are funny, because a lot of times people will come in, and they don't even know they have an ingrown toenail. They say, yeah, my toe hurts a little bit, it's red, uh, it was draining a little pus, pus the other day, and you know they come in with the expectation that they're going to walk in, get an antibiotic, and walk out. Uh -huh. The other situation is they've been on antibiotic, or maybe they're on their second course of an antibiotic, and yeah, it gets better, and then it kind of comes back, and then I try to explain to them with some, I draw little pictures and I explain <laughs> to them, well, guess what? You're taking care of the infection, but you're not taking care of the ingrown toenail. The, the nail is still ingrown. What causes it? So, number of things. Tight shoes can cause it, improper cutting of uh, the toenails. So Sometimes women's people, high heels in particular? High heels, very narrow, putting a lot of pressure on the, on the nail. Sometimes it could be from a um, bony abnormality underneath the, underneath the uh, nail plate, especially with the big toe, where maybe they had an old injury, they developed a little spur underneath there, and now the, the nail grows kind of incurvated. We call it a pincer nail, and you look at it and you can see it's not flat, it's just a different shape. It's, it's dipping, it's dipping in, right into, into the, the meat corner. of the toe. Correct. And then once it breaks through the skin as it's growing out, that's where, like you said before, that's where infection goes. You're, you're sweaty and it's dirty and you get infected. So it's the infection that people will first, you know, they'll have a little bit of pain, but it's the infection usually that brings people in. So they can take antibiotic, they can soak it, they can do all that, but they're not getting at the ingrown. So typically what we need to do is we need to numb up the toe, take a little sliver of the nail out, and then the other question is people will say, well, is it gonna grow back? It's potential that it will grow back, but after discussing proper nail cutting techniques and maybe modification of the shoes, uh, we can get it to grow out normally. Now, do you recommend people go to the nail salons rather than try to cut themselves, or do you have someone it, else should do it for you? It depends. You number, number one, it would kind of a few different sort of patient populations. Okay. One people, uh, you know, one set of people is the diabetics. Yep. They they shouldn't be going to the nail salons. They should be seeking professional treatment because okay. they may, like I mentioned it before, they may not feel it. They may cut their skin. They not don't even know it. Sometimes they'll be walking, you know, around the house and they see blood on the foot, uh, on the floor. So they do have to be really, really careful. They should probably seek professional attention. Okay. Um, other people, if they just want to go to the nail salon, I don't have a problem. If they're just telling them to be really careful, they shouldn't be pushing the cuticles back. The cuticle is a very important structure, and a lot of times women will like to have the cuticle cleaned. Yeah. But it's very important not to cut the cuticle because that's another um, area for infection to. Penetrate. Do we have a picture of that? Do you um, think, uh, I don't think we do, but the, but so the nail salons in general, if they want to go for a little buff and polish, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. But it's okay. just you know it's just really, and then there are some people that just have very difficult time, and that's a segue into some 
difficult toenails, fungal toenails. We definitely have a graphic right. so of fungal a, toenails. Let's have a couple of pictures, Roy, of the fungal toenails so that we can show the audience that. Yeah, so there you can All see, right. um, it's right there on the big toenail, it's discolored, yes. it's thicker, it's brittle, and you can even see on that outside that it looks like that's a potential for an ingrown toenail, just how it grows. Yes, yeah, so that it might dip down in on the corner. It dips down, exactly, and that can be painful. Now, people choose to do different things. There are several treatments for, to treat uh, fungal toenails. Now, it may be a topical medication, which is usually the easiest and the safest. There's laser that we do in the office. Many offices do that. And that can take some time and it can, it can be rather, you know, it can be expensive. That's an out-of-pocket type thing that the insurance would not cover. And then there's oral. There's p uh, pills that you can take. And what people have to understand is this is a slow process. The nails take, fingernails take about six months to grow out from start to finish. So if you were to lose a fingernail, it'll take about six months to grow out. If you lose a toenail, it could take 10 to 12 and even longer months to grow out. It takes a long time. So when you're treating it, doesn't matter if it's the topical, doesn't matter if it's the pills, doesn't matter if it's the laser, it takes time to treat and kill the fungus and then that all has to grow out. Just like fertilizing the grass. Yep. You don't expect to just go out there if it's, you know, get crabgrass, yep. that you put it on and today or tomorrow it's gonna look better. It's gonna take a long time because all that grass needs to grow out and you have to cut it away. So it's the same type with the fungal toenails. But there are definitely treatments. People do not need to live with it. Um, these treatments, you know, they're not 100% successful. They may be 75, 80% success, successful. But if anything, we can at least improve the appearance of the nails most often and get people so they're not so embarrassed. When they go to the beach, they're not sticking them in the sand. We can definitely get them better. So I'm thinking that people are nervous about their feet and that they maybe avoid going to a professional because their feet they feel their feet smell, or they do smell. Yeah. So what do you say to that person? Say like, uh, you know, would you say, you use a little isopropyl before you come, or just don't Ve worry about very it? Very common. What, what I ask people don't do is don't spray the feet with perfume. Do not. they often will spray the feet with perfume, and that's a very strong smell, and it hurts my nose. And it hurts so your nose, and you're it's, not sure it's good for you. Yeah, so I, I, I usually refrain from that. Now, you're right, a lot of people are very embarrassed about their feet. Yeah. Many people will, say they go to the they go and get a physical from their general practitioner and they don't even take their socks off number yeah. one there's probably don't take them off because the floors are cold yeah but they don't take them off so nobody's even looking at their feet so right. a lot of times we're the only one that gets to look at their feet now they come in and chances are when if you took your feet off right now no matter how bad you said they were they're yeah. not the worst that i've seen and i yeah. see some you know no, I, I, certain, I see some so yeah. and usually i can minimize that i say well this is easy okay, you have some things going on, but let's take one thing at a time and we can treat this, we can treat this. And you know, a lot of it, yes, it's cosmetic and there's some things that we can treat cosmetically and there's some things we treat just for pain. But right. there's no, if you come into my office, there's no reason to be embarrassed because we see, we see it all. Right, and, and you also take professional pride in, in having that sort of stamina or certain, this doesn't bother me and I, I see everything, right? It's Absolutely, certain professionalism. Absolutely. You know, and not to compare, uh, although I think plumbers do a great job, but not to compare too much with that, but well, the plumbers have to do stuff that everybody goes, ooh, but you know what, somebody's that's their gotta, job. Somebody's got to do it, and, and, then yeah. when it's, and when it's your job, you, you, you know, what, what I caution you is never look through the pictures on my phone, because you may see a few <laughs> pictures that you don't like. I, yeah. do, I often take photos of um, patient conditions just yeah. to save for their charts and things like that, so yeah, we can right. compare before and after. So you may not want to scroll through my pictures. Yeah, so you see <laughs> you that. may see th a few things you don't like. But you know, I also feel like toughen up a little here. You know, you gotta, you've got to um, deal with all of the things that we each get in life. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, so if you happen to have sensitive feet or feet that are reacting to shoes or whatever, uh, it is the best thing is to find a competent uh, podiatrist, Absolutely. hopefully this one. Uh, well, and there's <laughs> about uh, 500, well, there's 500, uh, about 500 podiatrists in Massachusetts, a licensed podiatrist in Massachusetts, and about 400 uh, active podiatrists. Tell us about your affiliation with the professional licensure of Massachusetts. So I actually am a past president of the, uh, it, well, we were called the uh, Massachusetts Podiatric Medical Society. We're now Massachusetts Foot and Ankle Society. Uh, we just recently went through a little change as our scope over the years has expanded. And like I said, we, we, we treat foot and ankle conditions. We're highly skilled, highly trained. The, I, I said I, went, I did a two-year residency. Now they're mandatory three-year residency. So now we're going from 11 years to 12 years, and many people are doing fellowships after that. Um, but I'm still on, I'm currently on the board. I've been on the board uh, of the Massachusetts Foot and Ankle Society for the past 16, 17 years. 
And so I'm still on the board of trustees. I'm kind of one of the old guys, believe it or not. That just <laughs> you don't look is, like one of the well, old guys. Well, I've been around the longest, and just <laughs> to kind of give you up if we're some, make some you an historical old guy. Ad, um, advice. And so I am still on the board. I'm currently a, a chair of the scientific meeting that we have. It's a New England States meeting. We have about three or 400 podiatrists that attend that every fall, and we're having that this fall in Framingham. And so there's three of us that chair that, and we put that whole meeting together. So that's, uh, that's a lot of work, but You're it's still- a busy guy. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a lot of work, but a lot of fun. And uh, constantly attending you know, new seminars for new procedures, getting our continuing med medical education credits, and yeah, it's just, it's fun to learn new things. So tell us if you would uh, segue into, what's the new science in foot care or in sure. bone care or like ligament care? Like what have you seen that, wow, this is gonna be something so that's coming there's, down the pike. I yeah, there, there, you know, it, it is exciting because this is definitely exciting times. There are a lot of new techniques. There are a lot of new um, medications out there, uh, non-opioid medications to treat pains. There's a lot of transdermal creams that are gonna, you know, that help to treat pain. Okay, tell us so, what transdermal so cream. So transdermal cream is just, yeah, audience. yeah, that's good. It's um, basically a, a cream that's been compounded with lots of medications in it, whether it's a pain medication in there, something to take care of numbness, something to take care of the tingling, maybe, um, uh, so lots of different products that would be in this cream that would be a pro a applied topically four or five times a day so people can, you know, they don't have to take strong opioids and, you know, with the whole addiction and yeah, all that, they don't they need to. So that. that's one thing. There's a lot of wound care products out there with growth factors, meaning they take different types of things out of people's bodies and they can kind of um, formulate these these very specialized growth factors that will target certain cells in the body to replicate and heal. So that's, that's, you know, that's another. And then with surgery, surgery is always evolving. The new techniques are always uh, evolving. People over the years have been very afraid of bunion surgery. And I think we have a picture of bunions up there. Let's see but if we can get that. Roy, do you have a, can you pull up the bunion so we can just kind of discuss that? That'd be great. So if you see, you know, that person right there, a painful bunion, and hammer toe, and a lot of times people come in and they say, well, you know, I've had this for years and my mom had it, my grandmother had it. Well, number one, it is hereditary. So shoes do not cause bunions and hammer toes, but shoes can aggravate it. So the foot condition, hereditary, that, that's more of the cause. Now, when people have, they've already exhausted all conservative care, they, they try wider shoes, they try inserts in the shoes, they put padding on there, they may have injections, so they've exhausted all that. They still have pain. So there are a lot of surgeries. Now, some people may, ha may have heard horror stories of family members that have had surgery. I don't wanna be laid up for six months. And, all. Yep. and I said, no, 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 P procedures have come a long way. Yes, they're done in the hospital, they're done outpatient, but typically, we can, most bunions we can repair. People can be ambulatory, they can be on their feet, two or three days maybe resting, but no crutches involved. They can be on their feet, they can walk. Um, the, the fixation that we do with the pins and the plates and the screws. Well, let's talk about that. Take sure. a, a, a person who comes in, has got mm -hmm. this huge bunion. They just, yes. They're like, oh my God, all my shoes have grown around this bunion. I, I, should I have to do that forever or can I, what would I do? Tell us, okay. walk us so through So after we do x-rays process. in the office and we sit down and we discuss, and if I'm satisfied that they've gone through enough of the conservative treatment and there's just no turning back, um, then you know, we talk about surgery. Now surgery, there's different types depending on the severity of the bunion. There may be just a little uh, procedure where we just shave the bump down. There could be a procedure where we need to cut the bone, shift it over a little bit, straighten things out. Typically we'll use a screw or two. And then there are some other more advanced procedures, depends on the severity, that we need to do a little further back. Now, with those procedures that are very common, people could not weight bear, they could not be on their feet for at least six to eight weeks. But now, through the advancement of new plates and screws, there are procedures now that they can walk on those just about immediately. So wow. that's changed the whole recovery. I always tell people the surgery is the easy part. It's the recovery that's you know difficult. People have active lives. They you know they they need to be up. They need to be around. You know they can't be laid up. So if we can provide surgery and still give them the ability to be you know of, of course it's going to be decreased activity, but they can still get around. They can. You know, walk. They don't need crutches. They don't need a walker. They don't need a wheelchair. That's very appealing you to wear people. Wear one of those boots. Like yeah, you boots. wear a walking boot. Sometimes yep. just a little specialized shoe. There's even a procedure that I do now that's minimally invasive. 
Now, minimally invasive is a term that's been out for a long time for gallbladders and, and even you know, arthroscopic surgery for knees, but we can actually perform a bunionectomy that is uh, about a two and a half centimeter incision, and we can do all the work through that, and that's pretty small. Typical surgeries for bunions are about a seven or eight centimeter incision. Okay. In medicine, we use so metrics. Two, yeah, Sorry. so two and a half is about the size of a nickel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. So it's a very small incision. We can cut the bone. We use specialized x-ray um, called C-arm in the, in the operating now, room. Do you do this at your office? No, we do, do this. At, these are all done in the space hospital. Space over to yeah. hospital? So we're done. Yep, it's done in the hospital. And this way, it minimizes the, the incision. What's nice about that, it, it's basically quicker healing. What, when people have surgery, a lot of the problems with surgery is the swelling, potential infections, things like that. So if we can minimize yeah, the, the incision. The more you open it, the more swelling. But if you Exactly. Can so if it. we can minimize that, minimize the disruption to the soft tissue, patients just have a much easier recovery and um, less complications, and they do really well. But you mentioned, yes, we do uh, uh, surgery in the hospital. Yep. Most of the surgery I do is right here in Brockton at the Good Samaritan Hospital, okay. as well as the surgery center in Northeastern by Roach Brothers. Okay. And I'm also on staff at the Beth Israel Hospital in Needham. So wow. I do surgery, depending on you know, geographics, where people live and you know, where they want to have surgery. You must have had quite a bit of training to like to do plates and screws and all that. Yeah, and we continue and <laughs> yeah. we, we practice. There's a lot of bones we call saw bones. We practice that and um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. You have to be handy with your hands and you have to know how to use tools, but it's, it's basic carpentry. It really <laughs> is. There's a lot of putting a screw in, lag yeah. screws do and things right. like that. Do it right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So measure, measure twice, no. not once. <laughs> not once. Same thing in so, foot surgery. I love that. Yeah. So. Um, what would you say that kind of brings us to a place of what would you say to an aspiring let's say uh freshman in college uh, or something like that whether to go down the path you're talking about what would you say to that person you know i think medicine can be difficult and a lot of a lot of times people will kind of push their um children out of medicine because it's it's a tough it's a you know third party payers insurance you're dealing with uh, lots of patients in public and things like that but I say, do what you love. If this is something that appeals to you, do what you love. My, I have two children in college right now. They're going a different route. One's going business. The other's uh, right now chemical engineer. So we'll see. But um, <laughs> so it's, you know, you, you got to do what you love. And right now I find it a very fulfilling, very satisfying profession. Like I said before, I have a nine to five. I have weekends free. You know, I may get a phone call here and there. We are in staff at the hospital. We, we do take call in the hospital. I'll be heading over there to see a patient. But it's, you know, it's generally there's no emergencies. And it's, um, it, it's nice. I mean, a lot of my patients... Where I may be able to attest to this, that I see them on a regular basis. You get to know them. You get to know the families. They'll say, do you mind if I bring my wife in? Do you mind if I bring my husband in? I'm coming in next week with my grandmother. Can I be seen as well? So it's nice. It's a, it's it's a family type of practice. It sounds much more fulfilling than, say, just a, a chop, chop, you know. Yes, absolutely. See the secretary beyond the way. Yeah. In private practice, is not, you know, it's difficult. I have to run my own business. But... There's a lot of pros, you know, that go along with private practice as well. The new generation, more and more of medicine, more and more podiatry, orthopedics, the different specialties, I feel they're going into more institutional, where they're going working for larger groups or the yep. hospital base. So that has changed a little bit. But being private practice solo, it's it's that's what I like. Yeah. So that it seems like you've had a, a really perfect fit. So tell me, like, what are we missing in the picture that you would like to paint for the audience about podiat podiatry? So the real doctors, number one, right? Real doctors, <laughs> yeah. uh, lots yeah. of training, as you mentioned, yeah. 11, now 12 yeah. years of training. So, um, you know, highly specialized. When you think of a podiatrist, it's, you know, it's the foot, but it's neurology, nerves of the foot. It's bones of the foot. It's the vascular system, the circulation of the foot. We deal with, you know, many dermatology. Yep. So, you know, you may go to a dermatologist because you have a nail problem, or you may go to a vascular surgeon, but if you come to a podiatrist, it's kind of putting the whole picture together. Right. And we, we still work with those other specialties, and we may send uh, patients out to other specialties based on need. But um, so it's, it's the foot and ankle, we get to treat the whole structure at once. And there's often patients come in with the bunion deformity, and there's a lot of by-the-way diseases that we see. By-the-way meaning, 
hey, by the way, I have this discolored toenail. Can you take a look at that? So, and that's usually as I'm walking out the door. So then I have to come <laughs> back come in back and, and you know, discuss that. So sometimes, yeah. you, know, I, you know, I'll even bring some things up. Does this bother you? Does that bother you? I notice you have a, you know, a lump over here. And so it's, um, yeah, that, that's, that's the fun part is just treating the whole entire foot. And it's a pretty complicated structure with 26 bones in the feet and lots of ligaments and tendons and everything that goes wrong. You and know, you depend on your feet more than anything. People don't realize it till they have something wrong, that they just take the feet for granted. They put their socks and shoes on, go about for the day, and they, they really do take it, uh, you know, take it for granted, their feet. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think it's just uh, amazing that we're ambulatory in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people do have foot problems because we're not made to, our feet weren't really made or structured to walk on concrete. So that's the, that's the thing people say, well, why do, why do we have so many problems? Well, you know, th there are a lot of issues. They weren't, obviously, with all the toenail issues and the ingrowns, they weren't made to be closed in. And you talked about sweaty feet, and that causes other issues, too, with all kinds of skin conditions. And athlete's foot is a big one. Um, sweaty feet goes on to, to kids. I mean, parents will often come in, bring their kids, you know, and this may be a separate issue. But they'll say, what do I do about these smelly feet? Well, if you get rid of the perspiration, bacteria loves the wetness of the shoes and the feet. Okay. So if you dry out the feet, a simple antiperspirant, or we have some prescription grade antiperspirants, um, that'll most, you most of the, the time. sneaker itself? Or no, you just roll it on. There's antiperspirant antiperspirants that you can roll right on the foot. If you're just putting powders and sprays in the shoes, you may be treating that, but you're not taking care of the cause. If you take care of the cause, which is the sweaty foot to begin with, yep. that's going to get rid of the odor. Wow. Yeah, so there's, there's lots of little tricks and lots of little things and people, you know, with, with medicine, you can't always be treating the symptom. You need to treat, you need to find the cause. So once we find the cause, that helps resolve. Wow. So there's an, uh, not a new thing, but something that's um, sort of regular now I want to ask you about. People have uh, computer desks that mm -hmm. stand up, that allow mm -hmm. them to stand up on their feet like a good portion of the time instead of sitting. Uh, what is that about, how, tell us about your feet standing versus sitting, like for extended periods of time. I've recently converted to doing that. Uh, if I work out in the morning really hard, I'll sit at my desk, but if mm -hmm. I have a regular morning, I lift the thing up and I stand up to do well, my computer I, work. you know, I think... Uh, but listen, I'm on my feet more. Listen, anything point. in moderation. I think that's good. I think maybe that's good for part of the day. They do say, you know, if you're sitting, you're supposed to walk about 10 minutes per hour that you sit. So ah. it definitely makes sense to get up and move, and this isn't just for your feet. Yep. It could be for your back and stiffness and legs and hips and, and everything, just to kind of just staying fit, you know, so you should be walking. So standing, but I think if you stand too long, you know, you got to be careful. It's all about posture as well. We need to kind of just make sure we're sitting or standing so, okay, correctly. So good. So segue into talking about back pain and feet. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, back pain and feet is, uh, you know, definitely go hand in oh, hand. You're like an encyclopedia here. This is <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a lot. I mean, we, we will actually see um, patients that come in, no apparent foot problem at all. Their primary care or a chiropractor sent them in because they have some foot sort of uh, mechanical structure maybe. They didn't have any pain, but maybe their foot is a little flat. And I think we have a picture of flat feet up there. Yeah, let's see we if we can get. get that, Roy. Can we get a flat foot picture? Oh, look at yeah. that. So right there, That's you see, really okay, flat. well, that person could come in, no pain at all. They've been functioning, you know, they're 30 years old, never had a problem, but all of a sudden they're having back pain. Well, it's very, very often we can take some simple devices that we can sort of support the arch, you know, after they've tried different types of shoes, shoes with a little bit of a lift, and we can take little orthotics like this, whether it's an over-the-counter orthotic that we just take right off the shelf or something that we custom mold to the foot, and this is basically custom molded so we can kind of right. push the against the arch. The length of their foot too. You know, you've, yeah. got to, you've got to custom make it to the foot it's size. All different, yeah. yeah, and we, what we want to do is we want to increase the arch. So now when we increase the arch, instead of the foot rolling in, it's going to support the arch the way it's supposed to. That takes pressure off the ankle, the knees, the hips, even the back. So yeah. often we're fixing back problems or we're taking away some of the symptoms because we're treating the root cause. Very nice. Yeah. Good. Uh, Another sort of specialized place that you probably have to go um, with cancer, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it seems like many, many people are affected by cancer and, and their relations, you know, their, their, their families. So in, the, in that, uh, when they have all the treatments, the toenails and the fingernails 
uh, leave. Tell right. us a little bit about that, and we should so you we, worry about it, or is it we, fine? What's what's you know the one thing with the cancer piece, the patients that are going through chemotherapy often will have problems with their toenails. We see brittle toenails, ingrown toenails, so often they do present to us. Now, we'll treat them, we can help them, you know, kind of get the nails to go a little better. If they have an ingrown, we take care of the ingrown. Sometimes it just may be that the, the nails are too thin, so they're having difficulty and they need to come in for a short time while they're undergoing treatment. Now, when the chemo is stopped and people just like their hair regrows, the nails regrow, and often, so it's just, you know, temporary that we're sort of helping out with that. But often they will, they'll get little infections and they do have issues, so we, we, we do see a lot of chemo patients. Now, the other thing is there are a lot of, you mentioned cancers, there are a lot of cancers on the foot, okay. believe it or not. People put sunscreens on. Some common places that they forget to put sunscreen is the top of their ears yep. and the top of their foot. <laughs> okay. they, they, it's often forgotten. So, you know, there's a lot, lot of uh, opportunity for us to diagnose, you know, melanomas in the, in the foot. So often we see something that looks suspicious, we can take a biopsy, you know, and then we, we'll work with the surgical oncologist or sometimes we, if it's something simple, we'll excise it ourselves. But um, th that's a very common problem in the foot. So there are all kinds of skin, tum skin melanomas and deep tissue tumors and things like that that Back we often Back to school again, us. Scott. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things that manifest themselves in the foot. Now, somebody could come in, they were relatively healthy, they have numbness in their foot. You know, we do a little workup. We send them back to their PCP. And next thing you know, I never knew I had diabetic. I was diabetic and here I am, diabetes. And one of the first things they noticed was in their feet. Like now, tingling in the feet or tingling something? Tingling in the feet, numbness, um, sharp shooting pain, neuropathy we call it. And we have a picture of neuropathy, of, we already showed it. But that, that can be very painful in the bottom of the feet. You know, but but this is a great thing. interview. Yep. We're going to put a link to it, and sure. we're gonna, I'm going to be sending it to like everybody I know that's like <laughs> who's got like yeah. these foot problems. Are you got to listen to what he said about this. Yeah. yeah. So this is fabulous. Yeah. I mean, it is very extensive. Um, like everything from the cancer, the melanoma to the shoe. I, I, one more thing now. I just thought sure. maybe think of it. So, the shoe, uh, the shoes that you wear. A lot of people wear these flip flops. I think they wear them too much, and I think they're almost dangerous. They fall off of them. Tell so us they, about that. So they do have to be careful. I mean, there's, you know, that's why workplace, you know, workplace injuries, people they have sort of strict guidelines of what they can wear, right? They have to be certain bottoms, and they have to be steel toes. So, yeah. you know, you do definitely need to wear the appropriate shoe for the appropriate activity. I tell that people to people all the time. Now, in terms of the fit flops and things like that, now there are some, there's definitely a place for them. There's, um, you know, people do like to take their shoes off and, and often they're barefoot. Now, barefoot for a lot of people, especially diabetics, but people with flat feet and different foot conditions, I try to steer them away from going barefoot. Especially in gymnasiums? Maybe? Yeah, so like if they, if they what have... What about pools? Let's talk about a little bit well, about... Well, pools, I, so that's why the fit flops and there's other UFOs, there's other kind of shoes and, and different things that people should at least have something so they're protected, their foot's not directly onto the ground, and they do get some support. So it, it's okay. I mean, it's okay if they, they shouldn't be running them in them. I mean, yeah. they could be slippery. And, yep, you've and must could, seen a few accidents Oh, yeah, we definitely that, some slips and falls and people stubbing their toe, you know, under a door or something like that because they were wearing, you know, I try to tell them not to wear the, uh, the cheap $2 fit, you know, flip-flops because yep. they need some yep. support. But there are definitely plenty out there that have nice support, nice arch, so they, they you know, for the appropriate time, it's okay. This is a great conversation. So I'm just gonna uh, have us uh, have Roy read our announcements and then we'll come back to Scott with a few more points after that. So uh, Roy, if you're ready, uh, take us away. Hi, this is Roy Cohen. The crew would like to thank mm, 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 mm. Maxie's Delicatessen located at 117 Sharon Street in Stoughton. You can reach them by calling 781-341-1662. The American Cancer Society is looking for volunteers to drive cancer patients to and from treatments. You can volunteer by calling 1-800-ACS-6662 or online at www.cancer.org. Il Samox Food Pantry and St. Anthony's Free Market is located at 2 Park Avenue in Stoughton. For more information, call Christine Gallagher that's 781-341-0611 or 781-341-0549. To get involved with Meals on Wheels, call Jessica 
at 781-344-8882, extension 2. The Stoughton Penny Saver, our business is advertising your business in Stoughton. To advertise, call 781-344-4833. Community Forum Showtimes here in Stoughton. You can see it on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays at 6 p.m., Monday at 8 p.m., Tuesday at 5 p.m., either on Comcast Channel 9 or Verizon Channel 28. If you have any comments or suggestions, contact us at communityforum1 at yahoo.com. Samaritans, 41 West Street, 4th floor in Boston, Massachusetts, 02111, or call them at 617-536-2460. The 24-hour helplines, 877-870-HOPE, or 877-870-4673. Samaritans, 800-252-TEEN, or 800-252-8336, or online www.samaritanshope.org. For you bingo players, I want to tell you about the Monday night bingo being held at the Ahava Torah Congregation, 1179 Central Street in Stoughton. The doors open at 4.30 p.m. The game start at 6.30 p.m. You come on down and win some money. They have two big prizes one is $1,199, and the other one is up to $3,000. So come on down. So I'm here with Scott Aronson, DPM, uh, Aronson Foot Care. He has an office at 1017 Turnpike Street, Suite 12B in Canton, Mass. The phone number is 781-344-1440. And I am absolutely pleased there's punch that we have Scott here. I don't know if we have any more. No? Okay, good. So um, I'm back here with Scott. And uh, while we were just offset for a second, I had an opportunity to ask Scott, like, what do we, you love to share with the audience? And he's got a couple of stories, one in particular about actually like saving someone's life because his knowledge of what's happening in your toes. So tell us that story. It's a beauty. Yeah. So, I mean, this just actually happened this week where we got a phone call from a patient's uh, daughter who just said, you know, her mom just wanted to say thank you. And, and you know, I had to kind of look back and, and, and look back. And so the week prior, she came in, she came in a couple of times actually, and she just kept complaining of the same toe, like an ingrown toenail. And, you know, and I'd gone in there and I'd taken everything out, you know, a few weeks prior and everything looked fine. However, the toe was, it was starting to look a different, slightly different color, it was a little purplish. And, and I said, you know, I, I think you, you have some clots in this toe and, and things. It's the circulation. It's a circulation issue. You're having a lot you of cleared pain. Cleared up everything else. Yeah, yeah. you're having there's, a lot of pain. There's something else, yeah. There's something else going on and you're having a lot of pain because essentially if you put a tourniquet on that toe, you have no circulation to half of that toe, the big toe. So I f almost had to force her and make an appointment to see a vascular specialist. Well, the vascular specialists, they do the tests, they do the ultrasounds, they find clots, they treat it, and essentially that those clots could have dislodged and that could have been, you know, catastrophic. Wow. So the patient's, you know, daughter just called to say thank you and she's right out from her mother's mouth, she said thank you for saving her life. Wow. So, I mean, that, you know, it doesn't get much better than no, that. That's, that's very gratifying. Huh? There's plenty of situations where Patients will come for second opinions or third opinions, and you know, there was one patient a few years ago that he actually had scheduled for an amputation. You know, sometimes the vascular surgeons and they get kind of to an end point, and they say, you know, maybe you'd be better off just having an amputation, and they look at it from sort of a different approach. Now, podiatry, we've just, our training is save the foot, save the foot. It's not good for business if. <laughs> There's you know. no need yeah. to do business. So, so well, you know, I, I just joke, said, okay. yeah. <laughs> so I said, this is, you know, this is my plan. This is, I think we can do this. And, you know, it took a few, several months, but we saved it. We, it, he healed up. He had a big hole in the bottom of his foot. It healed. We ended up making him some very specialized shoes afterwards because his foot was, you know, a little disfigured, but it's okay. We made him special molded shoes and inserts and all that. And he went on for several years of doing just fine with that. So we got to save his foot. And wow. the, the patient, they would come in, the husband and wife would come in sort of just on, you know, for regular checkups and to do things. And 
And they would just remind me of that every time that they came in, how happy they were that they met me. How and I often have, I have, oh I often goodness. have students that come into my office yeah. and interns from the local colleges and things like that, and they shadow me. And you know, when they hear these stories, I mean, that's a sell for them because you know maybe they're thinking about podiatry and they sort of, I think they see the passion that I have for podiatry and. And uh, that kind of sells them too. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's beautiful. And, yeah. and just general life advice: you know, do what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life, right? That's there you sort go. of uh, there you, you, go. you feel like you're uh, even when you're investing time and in even more training, especially if you're doing it all the time. Um, it's it becomes like a real, uh, you know, push to learn more because you you're seeing like where I might use this, where I might go the, next with yeah. what I'm doing. With, you know, with medicine, the more you learn, the more you'll see. I mean, if you don't know much of what you're seeing, then you're not going to be able to diagnose. So the more reading you do and the more learning, you find more pathology. You'll find things that are going on. And, you know, sometimes you may overlook it, but the, yeah, education is important. So where do you see, um, as we come to a close on our show, where's the medicine in, in foot care going in the future? Just give us a, a kind of a quick overview of where that's going to go. Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. But I, you know, hopefully with the, you know, these big companies, they continue their research and, and you know, proper medications and wound care products. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can avoid a lot of surgeries uh, w like vascular surgery, nerve, nerve regeneration and things like that. Uh, diabetic neuropathy, which is just a, a tough, tough condition for a lot of patients. I mean, it can be debilitating with the pain, with the numbness, with the tingling, with the, you know, it's just, it, it can be really difficult. So hopefully more, you know, we've been very limited on what types of medications we can use. Maybe that'll take the edge off a little bit, but hopefully we'll come up with some, you know, the pharmaceutical companies will continue to do their research and, and um, be able to treat the things like that. All right. Well, Scott, you've done a fabulous job. Thank and, you. Uh, just want to thank our audience so uh, thank everybody for watching. Uh, also want to thank the people in, that are in the background, not the foreground. So we have uh, Mike Hammond out back and Jeff Pickett, uh, Roy Cohen, um, all the people that helped put this show together. Um, and so we'll, we'll close by just saying thank you for watching. This is uh, Stoughton Media Access Cable's Community Forum show. And Scott, Dr. Scott Aronson has given us a real tutorial on how to take care of your feet. Go see a doctor, a podiatrist, if you're having any problem with your feet. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much.